Hello and happy holidays to everyone out there. Welcome to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Morgan, go ahead and ring that bell. Uh, it is a Christmas holiday miracle that this show is even taking place <laughs> because less than six hours ago, yeah. uh, I, you had left by then, but you and I attended Lennox Lewis's holiday party last night yes. uh, in downtown Toronto where we well, may no, or may not live. Well, man, Lennox Lewis is a man of many hometowns. That's true. So it could have been Toronto, could have been Miami. Could have been Jamaica. Could have been New York, where they also have Tim Hortons. That's true. Uh, yeah, this is not a dead giveaway. This does not <laughs> no. indicate where we're from. Uh, but we were there, sort of mingling with uh, yes. with, with boxing types <laughs> uh, and whatnot. And we are we are recording this at eight thirty in the morning. So it's uh, this is requiring uh, some green tea and some fluids uh, in order to make this happen. But we are dedicated yeah, to a, bringing ha- you this boxing talk. I have man. an espresso shot in here. Oh, do you? Okay. Yes. All right. That'll uh, that'll get us through this. Yes, but the Johnny Gill Christmas carols really good because I. I have to I have no choice but to be as excited as Johnny Gill is. Uh, Nobody's Christmas. more excited than Christmas than, <laughs> so, than, than Johnny Gill. I'm pretty charged up right now. We're ready to go. <laughs> uh, that the the Johnny Gill song that we reference, <laughs> "Give Love on Christmas Day." Uh, no one is more excited for Christmas to come than Johnny Gill. About 50 seconds into that song, he is grumbling. He's trying to hit falsetto. He is doing everything. Uh, less than a minute into the song, and if you guys say, "Well, what does Johnny? Gill, what does former New Edition frontman Johnny Gill have to do with boxing?" Johnny Gill is a very good friend of Sugar Ray Leonard, arguably his best friend. Yeah, and you can go on YouTube and find clips of like Sugar Ray Leonard uh, and Shane Mosley. Reminiscing on different fights, and Johnny Gill just kind of caught in the middle, like nodding as if he's been a fighter as well. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Roberto Duran's really tough, 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 tough guy. Uh, but I did have a moment like that last night. Yes, where I was talking to your man Lennox Lewis, and then you know Troy Ross was over here. Yeah. Uh, it's just a coincidence that all these guys are Canadian. Troy Ross, two-time Olympian. Uh, Chris Johnson walked in the room. Egerton Marcus, longtime Lennox Lewis sparring partner, longtime. Uh, Evander Holyfield sparring partner. Mm-hmm. So they're all there. I was talking to Lennox about something, and they started talking about actual fights. So I thought to myself, this is my time to just shut up and listen. Yes. I'm not going to sit here and try to pretend <laughs> that I know exactly. what these guys know about getting hit in the stomach because I don't. But as, as they started talking, <laughs> I'm smart enough to know when to shut up. Uh, Don Stevenson was there, too. Again, don't know why all these Canadian people were there, <laughs> but uh, they were they were all in the Everybody in, wants in to have a Christmas room. party in New York. No, uh, about? Yeah. <laughs> no, no one wants to go there. Uh, I, You're right. You and I do not know anything about uh, being professional prize fighters. However, you probably have seen the clip of uh, Meek Mill boxing on the internet, and I am convinced that w- given the, r- the right amount of training, knowing that he is six foot one, that there is a distinct possibility that I knock Meek Mill out. Meek Mill is not very good at boxing. No. I think Young Thug is better than him. I don't know. We're going to have to put those clips up side by side. Like, Young Thug sucks, but at least he's throwing straight punches. Well, Meek Mill's throwing straight punches. It's just that when he throws with one hand, the other hand is, like, by his waist. Right. And then his head is the just... The karate punch. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, like that. Right, yeah. And his head is just up. And his feet are square. So I just don't know what Meek Mill, like, if Meek Mill ever has to move, like, if the person fighting Meek Mill moves forward, what's Meek Mill going to do? Does Meek Mill think he's good? He yes. must. Because you yes. wouldn't post that if you didn't think that what you're doing is somewhat but here's impressive. The thing, here's the thing about people who box for exercise with boxing trainers who understand that these people are never going to get in the ring and are just really there to, to boost people's egos and make them feel better about yeah. themselves is that they have no clue how they look. Right. Like the internet is full of people saying, you know, posting videos of themselves boxing, hashtag work, hashtag getting it in, <laughs> hashtag boxing, <laughs> who, if you've ever watched boxing, you know, you realize within five seconds of watching these people that they would get knocked out if they ever got into a fight. Right. But these are the same people that will brag Not to just you. a boxing ring, a fight of, yeah. of any sort. Yeah. But they will. These are the same people that will brag to. Yeah, man, I train. Yeah, boxing. Yeah, we hit the pads all the time. We do Mayweather pad. You know, you know Mayweather. We do Mayweather. Pad They're also the same. The same people who have you know like aggressive hip hop songs about beating people up. Yes, and that really erases the illusion. All the, when you see Meek Mill on the heavy bag, you know Drake beating him in 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 a freestyle battle. Yes. Uh, you know in in diss tracks did one thing. More damage was probably done. Yes, the, the the footage of Meek Mill on the heavy bag. Now, but what I won't say, uh, 
with any type of 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 surety is that a word no that's more of a i want what i won't say with any type of assurance is that dre would drake would beat meek mill in boxing because we, we haven't seen drake no box. we don't yeah and we know that somehow Drake doesn't strike me as overly athletic. He's really big now, but he still doesn't. He still doesn't strike me as athletic. Right. He looks weight room big. Yes. Um, somehow, he, somehow, and I don't. Hey, he might be. Don't know how, but he, over the last five months, Drake has gotten significantly larger, and his head has grown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that says nothing about his level. He might be just as uncoordinated as Meek Mill is. Yes. Um, but it, but it, 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 it's amazing. Like uniformly, athletes think they're better musicians than they are. And then musicians think they're better athletes than they are. Um, like we were talking on the way in, we were talking about uh, you don't know, my, our man Tank featuring Wale. Wale thinks he's a great athlete. I've seen pictures, I've seen video of Wale running routes and catching fo- catching footballs. Wale's like his skill level is mid flag football skill level. He's the guy in your flag football team that always thought he should have been better. Wale apparently he, he played on Virginia. I I don't believe that, but Tank <laughs> Tank is a legit good athlete, man. Right. Tank's not just like some muscle bound goon. Tank is a good athlete. Like you watch Tank skip rope. Tank is very coordinated. Watch him play basketball. Tank is an actual good well, athlete. Well, Tank man. is in the upcoming uh, Floyd Mayweather celebrity basketball Ooh, game as oh, well. Listen, and Tank might go off for about. 28 points. T- Tank might not have any bookings all year long, but he knows that he has that. Listen. So that he, he he might not have a concert booked in all of 2016, but he knows that next year, that this year, every single year, he is going to train for that basketball when, game. And some of you guys viewing are probably wondering, well, what does uh, R&B Lothario um, Tank have to do with boxing? Tank... Showed up at Floyd Mayweather's birthday party last year in workout gear. Remember yeah, this? Yeah. On Instagram? Like, Tank came straight from the gym. Yeah. <laughs> he was over there bench pressing, checked his phone. He's like, oh, shoot, it's Floyd's birthday. <laughs> Let me stop by the party on the way like home. Like, dry fit on. Yeah, he, was still with, <laughs> he had like a sleeveless shirt on. But legit good athlete, Tank. Darrell Babs. Darrell Tank Babs. Good athlete. What, was it him or was it Tyrese who was in that? Remember uh, Floyd was doing road work and someone was trying to keep up with him? I think it was Tyrese. It might have been Tyrese. I think it was Tyrese. Yeah. yeah, and they're running, and like the guy is in the van, and he's just playing like probably playing a, guy. A guy. Yeah, yeah, he's playing guy, <laughs> and, the, and, and Tyrese is trying to keep up with Floyd, who's running, you know, like a seven minute mile. Yeah, <laughs> Ty- Tyrese just going to have to edit that yeah, you, real quick. You need a bike or something, Tyrese. <laughs> uh, prior to uh, our uh, Christmas festivities, uh, we were on the road to the Turning Stone Casino in uh, Verona, New York. Yes, uh, hit the road for four hours from wherever we are. Uh, be it Newark, New Jersey, <laughs> or uh, Toronto, Ontario. It's four hours. It's four hours either way. <laughs> exactly. Um, for a pretty darn good card, yes. top to bottom. Um, usually when you go, I mean, this is just how boxing works. When you go to a card, usually you're going to have some mismatches earlier on in, in the night, you know, like egregious mismatches where guys just get starts. So they're just picking up wins. Uh, not to say that every single fight on this card was a 50-50 fight. No. But a good good handful of them were uh, and all of them were competitive like there were no absolute cakewalks anywhere on this card so it actually for for once it was worth it to get there at 6 p.m. when yes. the first fight went on which is strange because again usually at a in a fight that takes place at a casino they don't want a bunch of competitive fights what they want is you out on the floor yes spending your money because you've paid for the ticket either way and also the the venue has paid them yeah so why would i put my good stuff on that like i'm it, basically doing this for free yes so i'm gonna give you some slop man because yeah. it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah the casino wants you yeah come to the building for the fights but gamble as long as possible um eat in our fine restaurants as long as possible yeah and then get here for the you know don't spend four hours in the arena this was the opposite you couldn't leave no once you got into the arena at turning stone i i don't remember it being like this i know we've been to a lot of turning stone fights but uh, apparently like you as soon as you get in there's no re-entry so if i saw you know like the the steve martinez fight and i'm like okay i'm gonna check out i'll come back when gabe rosado's on no no you can't they wanted you in there uh in the convention in the in the in the event venue or in the lobby of the event venue so that you could buy those thirty five dollar golden boy t shirts. Using uh, the Disney font, which Disney, is flatly illegal. With the Disney font. Well Peace Collective says it's fine. Um with the Disney font. That was what they wanted. Now if they had had like a Boxeo Cubano t shirt 
I would have bought it. Yeah. I would have bought one, like the guy we saw down in the front row. Uh, but they didn't. It was only Golden Boy gear. I wasn't yeah. that excited over it. Golden Boy gear and like five dollar drinks. Yeah. Well, see, I wasn't drinking. I was. Just why not? I mean, the the. That's the other thing. Like, how much money could they possibly make off of these five dollar <laughs> drinks? You know, why why not go? <laughs> let me hit the felt. <laughs> right. I'll give you more money that way. <laughs> right. Um, we're gonna hit the break, but when we come back, we'll actually talk about some fights. We'll talk about what went down at the Turning Stone Casino. Mm-hmm. It was a pretty good uh, last weekend, so to speak, in boxing. Yes. Uh, although, actually, we do have some fights on New Year's in uh, in Japan. But exactly. We'll talk about that next week. But uh, we'll get into these fights when we come back after the break. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and uh, Morgan Campbell here with you. We were in uh, Verona, New York uh, over the weekend, uh, although we were staying in Rome, New York. Yes. That's a sign over here. Uh, Rome, New York, uh, there is nothing in Rome, New York at all. Uh, we, on, on the Friday night, we got in uh, in and around 6 o'clock, and we needed to find somewhere to watch the uh, the PBC card, the, the Spike TV fights. So we'll get into that a little bit later on. But we, we go to the concierge, and, you know, we're like, okay, is there a sports bar around? We didn't want to go. Because here's the other thing about upstate New York is that even though you're only one highway exit away from something, those highway exits They're, are like 20 miles apart. Yes. So everything is just up the road. It's, <laughs> it's just only one exit. It's one exit. But it's not like it's, it's a long way away. Whether you're driving, whether you're taking a taxi, that's going to be costly. So we're yes. like, okay, let's stay in Rome. Didn't really know what was happening in Rome. Um, And we asked, you know, is is there a sports bar where we could watch this? Oh, yeah, we have a great sports bar. It's called Legends. Legends Sports Bar and Eatery. Legends Sports Bar and Eatery. They've got great food there. All kinds of TVs. They'll definitely have the fight on there. Of course, we get to Legends Sports Bar and Eatery. And the house lights are on. It's like 9 o'clock. The house light. It's bright as the studio here. Yes. Uh... Only tube TVs. Yes. Like a hundred tube TVs and exclusively playing horse racing. No, Didn't there, know how to change there the There was one that had basketball, I think. One or two. Yeah, it had like just had, basic ESPN on it. Yes. Um, and they didn't know how to change it. And it, this it's was like, in it addition never changed to, it. And this was in addition to the room, the adjoining room, where it was exclusively horse racing because it was off-track betting. Yes. Um, in addition to the fact that it was just a bunch of like dudes... <laughs> Dudes who look 60, but they were probably about 45. Right. And women do, like men and women, but they all knew each other. Um, and the thing to wear there was just like as much New York Giants gear as possible. Hat, Victor Cruz jersey, <laughs> his jacket. <laughs> they're not playing for two days. Gloves. <laughs> Doesn't matter. So they're just there drinking. And it's called an eatery. It's a sports bar and eatery. But I did not, the, in the 20 or so minutes we spent there, I didn't see anyone Order. I didn't see any no, food. I did see uh, chicken wing bones on the floor. Did you really? So that is evidence that so there was it, it's, it's, it's like when you find fossils. <laughs> right. Like at some point in the history of legends, food has been served. <laughs> so you can get your your picture on the wall at Legends in any number of ways by dying. There was one guy. Yeah. Who was just he was just a really popular guy at the bar, so they had his picture there, labeled the Legend of Legends. The Legend of Legends. There was another guy who bowled a two thirteen game at uh, Pin King around the corner. Yep. Good he's game, wearing, good he, game, but he's wearing a Blue Jays hat. Yep, two thirteen, holding up the score. Yeah, he got his picture on the wall. That's not even like you know, if you bowl a perfect game, yeah, you bowl three hundred. I, I don't know what I, I, do. I think you deserve. Maybe a, that's a what the Legend somewhere. of Legends did. Um, but I also love that they just had like for music, they just had the stereo just tuned to this local, this local classic rock station. <laughs> And that was the commercials a, are on. Yeah, and stuff commercials too. are on. They let it play. <laughs> Doobie Brothers, the Eagles, with static. Commercial. Like it's not even coming through. <laughs> no, because it's tough to get good radio in that part it of the is, world. It is, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, we were listening to like AM <laughs> six seventy, six twenty R and B with the, you know, no bass, no yeah. sound quality whatsoever. And if the clouds came in, forget it. Man. Done. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but after that, we, eventually we did watch some fights. Yes. Uh, I will say what was very unusual when, he got, when we got the Turning Stone is seeing Yuri Orcus Gamboa in the first fight of the night with nobody in the seats. Yes. This is a guy who not long ago was remember that like that hbo uh voyage that they took and i forget where they were like in the cayman islands or yes. somewhere and it was like the, the dinner mm-hmm. and it was like the, the the golden children of 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 hbo yes. it was like it was like gamboa and, yeah, and ev- donaire everybody except rigondia everybody except <laughs> <Rigondia>. <laughs> and I, I would imagine rigondia if, if rigondia and and 
Gamboa aren't good friends, they still know each other pretty well. Oh, yeah, they of came course. Up together. They both yeah. live in Miami. So I'm just imagining this text exchange. Um, <laughs> hey, man, you coming tonight? Where, where Gamboa, Gamboa texts Rigo like, hey, man, so I, I'll, I'll see you with this uh, HBO cruise tonight, right? And Rigo's like, <laughs> text back, what cruise? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> right? And Gamboa's like, oh, shit. Shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> but here's the thing. There's that, and then there's the fact that 50 Cent, if you go back two years ago, two and a half years ago, whenever 50 Cent and Floyd Mayweather broke up, remember 50 Cent was saying, yeah, well, Floyd, he's scared that Gamboa will beat him. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. why we broke up. Yeah. And then I'm about to take over boxing. I'm going to take over the whole industry. SMS promotions with, right here. With yeah. my guy, Yuri Yorkis Gamboa. You know, that was two years ago. This was the guy that was going to take over boxing. And now he's fighting on these fights that his promoter – has paid to stage on another promoter's card. Yeah. Which, uh, the poster behind you, the return of Sam Vargas, uh, promoted by Lee Baxter Management in Toronto, where we may or may not be. Um, I remember talking to Lee about, you know, that's what he he used to have to do. Yeah. Until he got to the point where he could stage his own right. cards. I mean, promoters, right. have, promoters have to do that all the time, but yes. usually only if you don't have... A stable. Right. You don't have the, the resources to put your own card on. Right. So 50 Cent has gone from... I'm going to take over boxing with Gamboa as my lead fighter to uh, who's who was the promoter on that card? Golden Boy. To calling Oscar and saying, hey, if I give you uh, if I pay for this fight, can you put Gamboa on the card against Highland Williams Jr.? Like that's how far, you know, he's fallen. That is amazing. It's it's mind boggling to me. And. Well, I mean, listen, at least with what he paid for, he made sure to get every little bit of value yes. out of that possible. So he pays for the fight. Yep. And, uh, you know, albeit it is very early. It's the first fight of the night. Yes. No one's there whatsoever. But if 50 Cent's going to pay for this, he's also going to ensure that every single song in between rounds is a 50 Cent song. And yes. It was. And the fight goes 10 rounds. So you get 10 50 Cent songs and you get your Yorkus Gamboa. Well, with, uh, the amazing part. So you had... Highland Williams Jr., the opponent, his little crew of friends was there. Um, and so they spend the whole fight just heckling Gamboa. Gamboa doesn't speak English. Deaf ears, guys. Either. They're like, Gamboa, you stink. He doesn't know what, what, what you're saying. What are you doing, champ? What are you doing? Like, he doesn't know what, what's he going on. He doesn't know what you're saying. You, you, for all he knows, you're encouraging him. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, but as much as they heckle Gamboa, uh, when Wangsta came on, all of Highland Williams Jr.'s friends were were singing along, like <laughs> word for word. And the fight, and the bell rang, started the round, and then they they go back into their heckling. And they also started uh, tried to start the USA chant, right? You know, I don't know how much boxing these guys watch, but the USA appeals to patriotism only work uh, in support of white fighters. That's it. That's a good point. <laughs> And not when there's no one in the arena. Not when there's no one in the arena. And when one of the people isn't white, then the the the, the people who are, are turned on by appeals to jingoism uh, aren't going to feel that connection to a guy that's not white. Also, like yeah, I know people always talk about how you know Cuban fighters don't draw and whatever, but this was a card that was 100% centered around Cuban fighters. Yes. You had Gamboa, you had Unieski Gonzalez, you had uh, Luis Ortiz. So there was a good portion of people who were either Cuban yes. or who were Latino and were going to associate with... The Cuban fighter. Yes. They're not out here chanting USA. <laughs> and they're out here to cheer for Gamboa. <laughs> like, right. If anyone's there. Well, when... when uh, when Because you saw the same thing in the main event. A very weak USA cheer. But then, like, all the Cubans, they're supporting Ortiz. Yeah. We're chanting Cuba, Cuba. Oh, yeah. But, you know, but the way it's pronounced, it's kind of like K-O-O-W-A, Cuba. Yeah. <laughs> Cuba, Cuba. But they were there. They were rolling. They were there. They were rolling pretty deep. The sure. Fans. Uh, we got to hit the break. But the, the 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 other, I guess, interesting thing about the Gamboa fight is that he actually lost some rounds to Highland Williams Jr. I thought I thought he Williams. Won, I thought Williams won the fight. You thought Highland Williams won the fight? Yeah, I thought six four. Like I could have lived with six four either way. Yeah, it wasn't eight two Gamboa. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Had it. Yeah, he lost several rounds to Highland Williams Jr. Oh yeah. And if Highland Williams Jr. was either busy or powerful. Gamboa would have been a, right. in a lot of trouble. But he was neither. A ton of trouble. Um, right. Yeah, Gamboa did not look good. Well, because Gamboa was a... You saw him when he walked by. Like, they list him at 5'5". Five five. He's not 5'5". Five five. No. He's probably about 5'3". And he's got the little short arms, and he has to be all the way inside or all the way outside, and that's two chances for him to get hit exactly. before he can land anything. <laughs> he's not quite... He's not really an inside fighter. 
Um, so he has a really, 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 really narrow margin of error. Uh, Brian Jennings proved himself not to be an inside fighter as yes. well, uh, judging on how that fight uh, turned out. And we'll talk about the main events and plenty more uh, about the weekend of boxing that occurred. So we'll be uh, back after the break here on Fighter of Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and uh, Morgan Campbell here with you. And at the Turning Stone Resort and Casino over the weekend, we saw uh, a real rarity in the sport of boxing uh, when it came to the Nicholas Walters, Jason Sosa fight. Yes. Usually, the fighter that gets ripped off is the B-side, is the guy who isn't the promoter's fighter. Right. Is... um, it, it, it's the guy who doesn't come into the fight with any advantages at all and then still gets ripped off. Yes. And it's it's one of the, not I wouldn't call it a, tra- there are tr- actual tragic things about boxing. This yeah. isn't one of them, but it is one of the, the real injustices. It's of not the a sport. tragedy, it's a travesty. Yeah, it's a travesty. Two very different things. <clears throat> and instead, in this fight with Nicholas Walters and Jason Sosa, we saw Walters very clearly win this fight. Yes. And yet somehow, not only did two judges find a way to score this a draw, but one judge found a way to score it for Jason Sosa. And, you know, we were sitting a little bit back. Uh, we decided to be civilians, actually. We didn't point yeah, this we out. Were. We decided to be civilians for this fight. First time in a long time I've been to a fight as a civilian. I, I, I don't get the opportunity to do that very often. So we had some credentials. We figured, you know, we didn't really have anything to do. So let's, let's just let's kick it like regular people. What is yeah. this like again? <laughs> um, so in, in, because I was a couple rows back, you know, I wanted to make sure. Uh, so I went back and watched the fight again. I wanted to make sure, okay, am I just like, did I have a bad vantage point? Right. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nicholas Walters won this friggin' fight. I have no clue how they scored this for Jason Sosa. No idea. Well, as we were talking about it during the fight, I was like, this is an entertaining one-sided fight. Yeah. Like, Sosa won a couple rounds, maybe. Certainly didn't yeah. win six or seven. He didn't even win five to get a draw. There was like no two way. rounds? Yeah. Like, Walters... Sosa fought hard. Sosa was competitive, but Walters was a step ahead in every aspect all night. And to to give you a clue about how bad the decision was and how, how thoroughly everyone in the arena was convinced that it was a bad decision, the guys sitting in maybe two rows in front of us were... Uh, they were like hardcore Puerto Rican fan Jason Souza supporters. The guy had on like the Puerto Rican flag wrestling mask. Yes, yeah, and yeah, then the they luchador both, mask. Yes, and they both had Puerto Rican flags. Like when they would play Mark Anthony, these guys are up in the arena on the on the on the PA system. These guys were up singing and dancing. Like these guys were. This was Team Puerto Rico here, and then when they announced that this fight was a draw, like those guys didn't even like cheer. They didn't gloat. They just said, "You know what." Hey, I saw him like I saw him just shrug. <laughs> yeah, he's like, hmm? yeah, I guess <laughs> we'll take we'll, <laughs> we'll take, take this. <laughs> we'll take this. We're not gonna get up and gloat or anything like that because we know. But that this never happens that way. No. So that that was and that compounds how bad of a decision it was. Yeah, um, that was the worst decision of the year. Uh, I think it was the worst decision of the year, and, and you know it, it's it's tough to think of decisions that were a hundred percent worse than that. Uh, at maybe maybe ever. Uh, you know, th- there are fights that have been very to, bizarrely scored. The only way to have made that one worse would be if Soso won. Yeah. But think about the fact that he was one round away on one of these other guys' scorecards. From winning the fight. Yes, I know. I know. From winning that fight. I, I, but and, and how do three judges see it the same way? Like, how do three judges see it wrong? I don't... It is really the question. No. And that, like, you know, every time we have a bad decision, we have this debate, like, hey, were, were they corrupt? Did someone pay them off? Or are they just incompetent? I, I mean, this wasn't, like, Walters was the top-ranked guy uh, who got a spot on this card. Mm-hmm. He was HBO's guy. If there were another HBO cruise, Nicholas Walters would be there with the yes. axe hanging out. Uh why, if anyone is going to get the benefit of the doubt, it'd be paid off. You know, if you're a conspiracy yes. theorist, uh, it would be to benefit Nicholas Walters. Yes. I don't get it. Uh, and I don't pretend no, to get it. I really don't know. I don't pretend to get it. But I did wind up exchanging text messages with uh, our man Phil Bud- Budwick. Yes. Uh, Nicholas Walters. And you love... <laughs> I love the stuff that happens by virtue of the fact that Nicholas Walters is in Panama. Okay, so you're this Jamaican guy 
who lives in Panama and people were like, oh my God, I can't believe he speaks Spanish so well. He lives in Panama. Of course he speaks Spanish. He's been in Panama for 10 years. <laughs> Shout out to our boy, Mike Coppinger. <laughs> but he wasn't the only one because other yeah, people said the same thing to me. I'm like, guys, he lives in Panama. What else? He's not... There are people that speak English in Panama, but it's not like he's going to get a chance to only speak English. There's not like this enclave of this one community where people hang out with only- Jamaicans. <laughs> right. Yeah. And there's all kinds of like second and third generation Jamaican Panamanians. He's also been there for a decade. He's been there 10 if years. If anyone lives anywhere for a decade, like usually you pick up a Right. Enough, right. So know. there's that. And then uh, Phil Budwick actually speaks perfect Spanish because uh, I think his dad was from Cuba. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. He speaks perfect spanish and this is and he's like in he's in shipping and receiving or something yeah and just winds up lives in dc <laughs> yeah lives in dc but because he does so much business in panama kind of falls into managing this fighter yeah um so we met him at the at the boxing hall of fame and he was with his crew of people that didn't speak any english and i was like so where did this guy come from so then we start talking he's like oh yeah i managed walters but he was saying that walters said that walters realizes he won the fight thinks he won the fight believes he won the fight and that as long as the fans think he won the fight, then he's fine. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not like that does anything for Nicholas Walters' stock or anything right. like that. I think anyone who, who watched that fight knows what the deal was. Uh, our man Phil also had to talk to us because they were stranded there because you can't get a cab yes. anywhere <laughs> between Verona and... <laughs> anywhere like, in, in central New York. Exactly. Any of those in little Utica, towns. You, you will never, ever get a taxi. Ever. We were, we're riding around in the cab uh, on the way to Legends sports bar and the the cab driver is driving but he's also the dispatcher so people call him on his cell phone so he answers the cell phone and says taxi and then he's doing something else on his other cell phone yep and then when he gets off both these phones then he writes down the address. on a legal pad <laughs> as he's driving <laughs> like takes next. it out right <laughs> so phil was stranded at the boxing hall of fame and then like, uh, it took us an hour to get a cab to get out here because his friends were like don't let that taxi and he's like uh, it'll be a while uh, and then our other cab driver, uh, you know, <laughs> when when people uh, are just very confident that everyone else in the car is racist, and they, they could, he could just bring whatever he wants up, uh, <laughs> like, well, you, you see the school over here, like, uh, you know, the the imbalance between uh, men and women there. No wonder these Muslims want to blow, blow up our country. That I'm is like, actually what, in the that world? is actually what the cab driver said. He yes. said, "No wonder these Muslims hate us. No wonder the Muslims want to blow up our country." Now, any three, any of the three of us in the car could have been Muslim. Could have been "quote unquote" Muslims. Yeah, right. Yeah. How does he know that? Like, he was very confident. Or could have been very offended by that. Yes. Uh, which I am. But like, but what are you going to do? That cab driver also wasn't very perceptive because he also thought that we were like college students. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when, when you when guys, you, get, when, when you kids grow up, <laughs> right? You'll when understand. You, when you guys get out of school. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Just I'm just happy to be in the cab, man. Right. Because I'm not going to get home from this Walgreens uh, in the middle of nowhere if, if, if I don't just agree with what you're saying. <laughs> All right. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about the main event between Luis Ortiz and Brian Jennings. It's been a pretty good month for yes. heavyweight fights. We haven't had too many dull ones. Man. We'll get into that when we return here on Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and Morgan Campbell here with you. We got to witness the real King Kong. The real King Kong, live and in person, As Luis opposed, Ortiz. So is that a shot at Joseph Agbeko? I think it is. Joseph Whose actual Ag- name is King yeah, Kong? Yeah, his actual middle name is King Kong. That's on his birth certificate. He's the real King Kong. Yeah. I, 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 Ortiz just gets to call himself King Kong because he comes from a country where, where racist nicknames are still okay. Yeah. But, and he's okay with it. He's... He's absolutely fine. He should it. ride with our cab driver from Rome, New York. <laughs> exactly. like, yeah, just all uh, all the racial <laughs> slurs just, back and forth. Man, It'd be totally fine. Um, uh, but Luis Ortiz, uh, you know, in, in in all honesty, is I think we found out he is he's a real deal player in the heavyweight division, and yes. really we had no way of knowing. You know, the, the fact that. Um, you know, scored that knockout win on the uh, on the Triple G undercard, uh, knocks out Latif Coyote, then test positive for steroids. Well, I love uh, that moment after the fight where they're interviewing him and Ortiz says, yeah, I, I just want to say something to all the people talking this garbage about me being on steroids. And then you're like, wait a minute, but didn't you just you, test positive? You were on steroids. <laughs> so, <I> mean, I, <laughs> don't act like you don't know where it's coming from. Right, I don't know yeah. why people keep saying I'm on steroids. It's the positive test, Luis. I mean, you could say... You know, vehemently, I am clean uh, now, you know, but you can't be shocked. Right. Or, or you can't 
be surprised that people would think that. Like you te- well, exactly. tested positive for steroids. I don't I, know what's a, that's. Of course, people are always going to think. You just that. have to live with it. It's always going to come up. It's like your man R. Kelly acting surprised when people <laughs> bug him about and people question him about having sex with teenage girls, and he doesn't know where it's coming from. Yeah. Well, it's it's all right there, R. Kelly. Yeah. It's all in the court records. You can you can say you're going to go and, and get a rib witch. <laughs> it's all in this long history <laughs> of settlements. Don't I, I don't know where this is coming from. This is never. Yes, it's happened to you, R. Kelly. You yeah. can tell by how sensitive you are. I I, I don't hear this negative feedback. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't hear any of that. You don't hear it because you surround yourself with yes men. Right. But it's and you it's don't there. log on to Twitter. <laughs> right. Because so, every day someone's telling you. This about is this. not to call Luis Ortiz the R. Kelly of boxing. No, he's not. That's true. That's true. That was uh, your man Travis Kaufman from last week. Tra- if if Tra- anyone were the R. Kelly of boxing <laughs> with, with shady uh, yes. cases in the past, it would be Travis Kaufman. Yeah. But this Ortiz can't sit here and act surprised that there's suspicion that he's on steroids. Because he in the recent past, it's not even like like Shane Mosley can say, no, nah, that was 10 years ago. That was back when I was with some shady folks yeah. who, uh, who deceived me, blah, blah, blah. Like, Ortiz, it was last year. Yeah. So accept it. Roll with it. Yeah. Like, it, was, it was the night before Mayweather Maidana 2. Right. Yeah. So accept it. It's going to happen. But just and, and you might not like the questions, just, but just don't act like you don't know where they're coming from and you, you can't understand why people are asking you about this. Um, there's also the fact that he has, he has real power. Real power. He is giant. Yeah. He is massive. And here's, there's a, there are a few things going on. Because remember, as the fight started, I asked you if – Brian Jennings had been boxing his whole life. Yeah, no. You said he had a late start. Uh, and you could kind of tell. And when talking to your man, Lennox Lewis, last night, I asked him what he thought about the fight. And he said the, the, the thing that st- really stood out to him was Luis Ortiz's comfort level in the ring. Um, you know, and that comes from, and that stems from just the, the experience advantage he has you know, over, especially over a guy like Jennings, who has a late start in in, in boxing, who admitted to that in in his post fight interview, yeah, he didn't he said, make an excuse. He said, "Well, listen, the pedigree, the pedigree. Was, was too much, right? Yeah, because there were things that, like everything that Jennings should have tried to do to Ortiz, Ortiz was already doing to Jennings. Yeah, and Ortiz, I like Ortiz because it was he was pretty, he was versatile. You know, he would come forward and fight, um, but then he also did what I love the the form the the formerly fast heavyweight move." Backpedal flick jab. Oh yeah, like yeah. post nineteen seventy six Muhammad yeah. Ali, and that's just, and yep. that's your whole fight up on up on the toes, <laughs> up on the toes, backpedaling flick jab. Um, you know, but he wasn't doing it for whole rounds. He was just doing it, you know, just just to give Jennings a different look. Um, you know, but when it came time to end the fight, you know, he he wasn't gonna and and for whatever reason, a lot of Cuban fighters have this reputation, you know, for being guys that won't engage, guys that just want to be cute and touch you and win on points. Um, Rigondia was kind of like the most extreme uh, manifestation of that style, but every Cuban fighter is not like that. Um, Bartholomew's not like that. Nope. Luis Ortiz is not like that. Junieski Gonzalez isn't like that. Definitely not like but that. But as the women sitting behind us said in, in, in the fight with the Rosie Perez accent, he's not fighting right. <laughs> he was not fighting right. <laughs> he was definitely not fighting right. <laughs> he was yeah. not fighting yeah. right. Um, but Ortiz, you know, his versatility really stood out to me because when when he needed to do to 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 be again formerly fast guy backpedaling with the flick jab, he was that's what he was. Uh, but when it was time, you know, to do real because he can fight on the inside, which yes. is which is what makes him different from Gamboa. Gamboa has short arms, needs to be close, but he's not necessarily an inside fighter. Whereas yeah. Ortiz knows exactly what to do on the inside to land punches. Gamboa needs to land something big. Like a, a you know like a leaping left hook yes so that he can flurry and then retreat yes Ortiz can be comfortable in there yes uh, and and he was hitting Jennings with pretty much every uppercut he threw <sighs> like the, the 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 uppercut eventually floored him but there were two uppercuts immediately before that yes like Balrog yes the Street Fighter he just uh, that's all he's got he's just gonna keep throwing this well yeah and and the one that that, that eventually knocked Jennings like onto his face um. You know, that's a knockout of the year contender. And further to what we were talking about last week, uh, it doesn't behoove you to turn in your year-end awards at any point before the very end of the year because something like this might happen. Exactly. And he's going to miss the voting deadline. That's right. So he should. <laughs> so this should be an early candidate for knock best knockout of 2016. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be like ew, like we said last week, uh, the Grammys. Right. You know, if you release an album in November, <laughs> no sir, better better wait till next well, year for that Grammy. It's kind of like what happens like in. 
my day job in the newspaper industry. I work for the Toronto Star. Download Star Touch if you get the chance. Uh, available at the app. How store. do you work there when you live in New York? Yeah, I move Telecommute. around. Telecommute. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, this time of year, because awards voting, award submissions come in January. So, like, in December, everyone's, like, publishing all these big investigations and all these series because you want it to be fresh on the voters' minds. Right, this is the time to do yeah. it. Because when we do our fight of the year in uh we do our year-end awards. I know mine is going to be like backloaded with stuff that happened like in the last two months of the year because that's yep. what I remember most. Right? Sure. Um, but this year was a legit knockout of the year candidate. And also what it gave us was for two consecutive weekends, um, high stakes, high skill level heavyweight fights where the where the winner wasn't necessarily apparent beforehand, um, where you you couldn't really pick it. Um, so you, this is one of these cases where they actually do have to fight. So you actually can see who's better because you wouldn't necessarily know on paper which of these guys is better. But also because the the division has opened up, because people believe that they could beat Deontay Wilder, because and especially now that Tyson Fury has mm -hmm. the title and people believe that they can beat Tyson Fury as well. These are these fights that we were talking about. Like, is the skill level in in the heavyweight division, uh, you know, particularly high right now? No, it isn't, admittedly. But we've always said there are a lot of fun fights to be made. Yes, and these were fights that just weren't getting made because the best move was just to wait around and try take to your easy paid. fights and then just take the Klitschko payoff. Whether you win or lose, yep. that was the best financial decision for you, and the promoters were making that. Yes. Now the best move is to fight each other. Yes. And because you can actually earn that shot, uh, and these fights are exciting too, and and and. People want to air stuff like that. You know, yes. they, they want to air a Luis Ortiz fight now. So right. you, you've, you've done yourself a service by putting him in the ring and giving him a test. Now, Ortiz has shown that he can take a punch. Yep. Because Jennings hit him with some thunderous blows. When Ortiz just... Didn't move. Just took it. Well, that guy's rock solid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he is. He's a tight end. He's probably bigger than Gronk, right? Oh, 100%. Like, yeah. He is... Rock can solid. jump over the rope, right? So he's his body's just like a big shock absorber. You just hit him, boom, he just takes it. Um, so he has that going for him. Um, and again, the skill level, the comfort level, the savvy. Because uh, when people talk about a guy having three hundred amateur fights or whatever, is okay, that's fine. But that's three hundred amateur fights, and they're all all those fights are four rounds long, and you fight a certain way to win them. And at a certain point, having that many amateur fights actually works against you as a professional because you're just locked you're, you're in this eroded, yeah, and that too. When well, you're yeah. just locked into this amateur way of fighting, um, whereas Ortiz has shown that he knows how to fight like a professional. Um, Ortiz's biggest challenge is whether or not at a, at some point he starts fighting his age which we think is 36 but suspect might be a little higher we're gonna hit the break but one guess as to what his age actually is i think he's like 48 years old i would say 45 just just looking at his legs he has yeah. the legs of he has the old guy skinny legs huge upper body skinny legs he's not, he's not the age that he's listed as I, he's like the people in Legends Sports Bar <laughs> and, and, and Eatery. He, he, he's not the he's not the age that's listening. He's like he was right. like a Fausto Carmona, uh, right? Right. Like, right. How old are you, Luis? Well, how old do you need me to be? <laughs> and that's how old I am. All right, we're gonna hit the break. We'll be back with more here on Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman, Morgan Campbell here with you. Uh, basically, every Cuban fighter in existence was in action uh, over they the weekend. all fighting, yes. All of them were fighting, uh, most of them in Verona. But then Rantis Bartholomew was also in the main event on PBC on Spike on uh, Friday night. And um, another really fun main event. Spike yes. keeps hitting the jackpot yes. with these PBC fights. Uh, they keep uh, inheriting the best fights the PBC puts on every yeah, single week. Exactly. And, it, and it's a shame because that's probably... The smallest audience, yeah, it is. Yeah, NBC has. Yeah. Um, so when it comes around to the to the NBC, although the last NBC fight, Demarco uh, Figueroa, yeah. Figueroa was very exciting. Yeah, yeah, Kid Blast. Um, again, we talk about the perception that all these Cuban fighters are, are, are cuties, that they're all a bunch of Rigondeaux and and Yoel Casamayor is just running around brushing punches off and never getting hit. Yeah, Bartholomew is not that guy. He's more like late career Yoel Casamayor. Gets hit more than he would Not as slick as he likes to think he is Yeah And needs to be a little bit more powerful than he is uh, To really make that style work He wins fights They're entertaining Probably closer uh, than he would like them to be Yeah This looked like In, in, in the middle of the fight Before that cut really started to yeah. hamper 
uh, Shafikov. This looked like it was going to turn into a replay of Bartholomew Arashu's Mani. Yes. A fight that Bartholomew should have lost. It just looked like he was going to be out hustled. Yeah. But suddenly, whether it was the cut uh, or whether Shafikov just did wear down over time, suddenly Bartholomew's work rate was greater than his. And it yeah. looked like, because Bartholomew does have the, this problem of falling. Uh, getting a little bit too complacent because yes. I think Bartholomew has this idea of how active he's going to be in every round, and he's going to be that active regardless of what yes. happens. Like he's going to, you like know, Josh Claudie. He's like Josh Claudie, but a lot busier. Like yes. he's still a fairly busy fighter, so it works for him. But he's like, uh, if you go out and you have, you go for a run and you have a pace in mind, yep. you know, you're running behind like the rabbit. Like you're, you're not going <laughs> to pass that rabbit. <laughs> yep. You're gonna, you're, you're like you're the guy with the sign with right. your with your pace group. Eight minute miles. That's it. That's it. That's where I'm I staying. Might feel exactly. Uh, but Bartholomew, you know. Decides what that work rate is going to be, and he sticks with it, and 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 it works for him because uh, it is active enough that a guy like Shafikov, I think in this case, did wear down, and uh, it, it, especially after that cut, I would say like in the ninth round, he really did start to take that fight over. Well, people forget too, like the boxers are human beings. If you're doing something that involves physical activity, and you have a cut, so some of the blood. It should be going to your muscles, carrying oxygen to your muscles. Is now running, <laughs> landing on the mat, right? Then it's not free, it's not bringing oxygen to and from your muscles, so you're gonna wear out, right? If yeah. people act like you know fatigue and bleeding are completely um, independent phenomena, not necessarily. Like if if I'm running and I bleed, like if I have a real cut, I'm not gonna be able to run as fast. Yeah, there it goes. So that. The, the, the cut might have had not just a psychological effect on Shapikov, but, you know, a physical effect. You lose some blood, you're not going to have the same level of energy as you would have had if you had all your blood. And, and people... Um, it's not like he's over in the corner, like, um, eating <laughs> eating uh, cruciferous vegetables build, to build his iron back up, <laughs> you, you know? Like gels. <laughs> yeah, I'll to build his that. iron back. Don't worry, I'm, <laughs> I'm back. Like, blood's replacing itself <laughs> as we speak. No, 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 no. This is, this is boxing, man. This is... This is to try to explain to people, like, this... The punches have real consequences, yeah. right? And people think fighters are just machines. I'm like, no, no, no. Because if you had an oil leak in your car or a gas leak in your car, some fluid that's supposed to be in your car is now dripping out of your car, your car's not going to perform as well. It's the same thing. Like, it's bad enough you lose sweat. When you lose blood, like actual blood, it's going to slow you down a little bit. Well, yeah, and that's you know that's an interesting point because I think the way – we're a little bit demeaning when, when we talk about cuts and, and fighters and whatnot. People always say something like, oh, he just – couldn't deal with the cut, huh? Like you know, just broke down after he got cut. Well, like yeah, I mean there are <laughs> there are reasons for this. It's not just it's an injury. It's an injury, <laughs> <laughs> guys. A cut is an injury. Oh, he just couldn't deal with the broken hand. No, he couldn't. No. The hand was broken. It's, he was punching with his hand. <laughs> and it's broken. Right. So. <laughs> and, and and I think too, like the extreme outliers uh, taint how we view everyone else right in the world of boxing so there's like ali fought all those rounds with a broken jaw against right. ken norton um our man razor yep. ruddick fought all those rounds against tyson with a broken jaw so we're like oh everyone's supposed to do that and then those are very unusual or hey arse can look like rick flair <laughs> right. after he cut his forehead <laughs> right. you know, like, yeah these are very and these are very unusual cases even among people with extremely high tolerance for pain these are still very and and again an injury is an injury people keep it's like the old idiot high school football line well are you hurt or are you injured but when a guy's injured like he's injured a cut is an injury so it's not it's often isn't just a matter of of heart um and again as we were saying before some of the some fighters tell me there's better to get cut above the eye because there's fewer nerve endings right but again it's an injury you're losing blood blood's running in your eye it's not just a matter of heart or a matter of choice physically if you can't see as well you're in trouble uh, coming up after the break, we'll make some choices. Uh, we'll add some fights to the uh, YouTube Classics playlist, and we'll wrap this thing up. We'll be right back here on Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Yerdman and Morgan Campbell here with you. Time to add to our YouTube Classics playlist. So we're going to continue tweeting this out. We'll post it on uh, our Facebook pages as well. We continue to add classic fights. And uh, these are the fights that we talk about every single week. We'll probably reference them at one point or another. So yes. you'll uh, get a better understanding of what's going on around here. Uh, this week, I am going to add a fight that uh, maybe isn't the best fight for action, but it is one of the more unique atmospheres uh, that we've ever seen a boxing match take place in. 
season. It is Dwight Muhammad Kawi and James Scott oh. from 1981 at yes. the Rahway State Prison. Uh, so they allowed boxing matches to take place in the, the prison. Because James Scott was in jail. Was in jail. Uh, mm-hmm. And they allowed him to train. Yes. Uh, and he was... Uh, apparently, you know, and Marv Albert was telling me this. Like, he was nervous all week long because the prisoners were not really happy with the fact that he got these yeah, he advantages. Got special treatment, very special yeah. treatment. Um, so there are there are more exciting Dwight Muhammad Kawi fights. Uh, Kawi for me might be my favorite fighter ever Listen, to watch. Guys, after you watch this, just go down the uh, Dwight Muhammad Kawi uh, YouTube rabbit hole. One of the great nicknames in all of boxing, the Camden buzzsaw. That's the, it might be the best. <laughs> the Cam, because he was like, uh, he's built like Darren Sproles. Yeah. Right? This little like short five guy. Five foot six. <laughs> fought light heavyweight and cruiserweight. <laughs> Just muscles everywhere and like a, a neck like a tree trunk or a log. Um, really exciting fighter. Skilled, yeah. skilled fighter. Short guy. Yeah, definitely check that out. Just the, uh, the, the bizarre nature of a fight happening in a prison <laughs> is, a, is enough of an experience. Perfect. And because we're talking about... Uh, Year-end award winners. Um, this fight was a knockout of the year, uh, 1990. Uh, and because the author of the knockout, it's his birthday this week. Uh, Toronto's own Donovan Razor Ruddick, um, April 1990 against Michael Dokes. Dynamite Dokes is the yep. name, no? Michael Dynamite Dokes. Uh, it's a four-round fight. There's a lot happening there. There's a lot at stake. Um, and Dokes too, and he'll come back a couple times on the YouTube playlist. Was a tremendously skilled heavyweight. Uh, just couldn't lay off the cocaine. Like if it wasn't for cocaine, who knows what this guy could have uh, agreed yeah. accomplished. And you see flashes of the skill in this fight, and then <laughs> Razor Ruddick just puts him straight to sleep, <laughs> like straight to sleep. Um, knockout of the year, Razor Ruddick's birthday. Happy birthday, Razor Ruddick. Hopefully you can stay retired. I doubt it, but I hope you can. Um, happy birthday and you guys will enjoy this knockout alright enjoy that fight enjoy the playlist and we hope that you enjoyed uh, the show as well we will be back next week happy holidays everyone see you guys soon